Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. Today, we're going to talk to Kai Stahlenberg all about thrash metal. No, I am not joking. We're going to have an episode here talking thrash metal. So, let me introduce you to Kai. Kai, how the devil are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm good. And obviously, we have a mutual friend. And you're sitting in his studio at the moment, Mr. Christian Kohler. I just entered Kohler's control room because I was doing a full punk rock guitar recording session all day and didn't have the time to set up the video equipment in my control room. So I just wandered down the hall to Kohler's room and now I'm here. It's quite apt that we talk to a German about thrash metal because I think thrash metal simultaneously evolved in both um, Germany and the US in the same time in the 80s. I'm sure many people are familiar with the American bands such as you know Slayer and Testament, Exodus and Overkill. But of course, in Germany, you had Creator, Sodom, Destruction, Tankard, and many other bands. How did you get into the genre? Was it sort of, I mean, you, you were either not born or very young in the 80s. I was uh, born in the 70s, actually, uh, oh, okay. 78. So I, I witnessed the whole 80s, uh, more or less. And actually, I started listening to metal like at all uh, when I was 10, so in 88, which uh, was right before uh, And Justice For All came out, like the Metallica album with a low bass volume. Famously. The non-bass bass album, yes. Yeah, and I guess uh, that's uh, that was my intro introduction to thrash metal. Before that, I was listening to uh, like mainly Iron Maiden, like new wave of British heavy metal bands, and uh, also ACDC. Probably my first thrash album I listened to. I uh, got introduced uh, to by a friend, and it was Injustice for All, which just had come out in '88. There's a documentary about Teutonic thrash called Total Thrash, and you mix the and recorded the title track of the film. The band I recorded uh, it uh, with was Traitor, like a German thrash metal band. And they also playing like the kind of old school style, but the, the band is of course much younger than like Metallica or whatever, like a newer generation. The singer of, and, and bass player of Sodom, Tom Angel Ripper, he's featured in that uh, song, Total Thrash, uh, which ended up as a title song for the, the movie Total Thrash. Thrash. At least my recollection from the 80s was incredibly aggressive, like so bright. Is it still that way in modern thrash? Um, is it still like, you know, really clicky, really bright, really rip your head off? Is that is that something inherent in the sound? Or am I quite simply oversimplifying everything, probably? I think there's actually like different... Uh bands that are different sounds and sometimes uh, even within one band you listen to the different albums and they uh, sound kind of different. One thing uh, that was really funny when I was talking uh, with the Traitor guys about the sound, I, I worked with them before so uh, the, the main direction was clear but I think I sent them the first mixed version. I talked to Matze, the guitar player, and he was, yeah, it has to sound a bit more old school. And, and I was thinking when I'm, I'm hearing old school, you know, I'm thinking like a, maybe a bit warmer sound, not such a clicky bass drum. And then he showed me a um, creator song from the, like from 95 or something. He was like, no, that, that's what, what I mean by old school. I was like, okay, 95 is old school for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for me, yeah. If you said old school, I'd be thinking classic rock as well. I'd be thinking tape, warmer tones, exactly. Less clicky, kick less bright. But yeah, my recollection of the least of thrash I heard in the late 80s was definitely like really offensive and incredibly bright. But that was kind of the, the whole thing. Now you've done a course with Christian. What's it called? Total Thrash? Yeah, it's like a mix run through, a full run through through the mix. I show everything I did during the mix of the a song. Well, we're going to show a little bit of that course for people so they can check it out. When you're recording thrash, so are you recording drums, et cetera, in any other different way? Or do you find just the classic way of recording, you know, 57 or top and bottom of a snare, you know, uh, I don't know, D112 on a kick, the, the, the usual things that we do, you know, there could be different makes and models, but, or is there anything specific about maybe the way the drums are tuned or any particular tricks, or is it in the mixing that gives it that extra aggressive sound? Definitely not the old school. 
Um, we didn't have a real bass drum for the recordings, uh, but our uh, famous and infamous silent trigger bass drum that we use a lot here at Cole Keller Studio, which is a converted 16-inch floor drum with a mesh head. So in the room, it's basically silent. Now you don't have any bass drum in the room mics or almost nothing in the overheads. It's, it's, it's basically silent. So we trigger it right away. So it's a sample that I used. Uh, already during the recording. So that was kind of special and a bit uh, more modern. And um, also concerning like overhead and uh, cymbal mics, I generally like to record like every extra cymbals like China, but also of course, ride and hi-hats separately. And also like the, the main overheads are, are not like trying, I'm not trying to capture the full kit. Uh, it's mainly like the main crash cymbal mics. So I'm relatively close and directly over the cymbal mics. So uh, I don't even want like a lot of snare and toms and the overhead mics. It's more like cymbal mics and I have like close mics for the toms, um, close mics for the snare top and bottom, where I used uh, the SE V7X for the, the top mic. I use uh, that a lot nowadays because it gives me better rejection from the hi-hat and in thrash metal especially there's a lot of open hi-hat which is like really loud and still um, close to the snare of course so um, better rejection is good. The rest of the drum kit it's it's natural like low tune toms, pretty um, fat sounding toms, balanced uh, cymbals. So what's the thinking about not having a live kick drum in the room? Is that so if you have to do some editing, there's no kind of flamming for the kick bleed in the room? Exactly. Like um, the main reason is uh, firstly, we do a lot of editing when stuff really tight, you know, and there's a lot of uh, fast bass drums or double bass drums and thrash metal. It, it makes everything much easier. Actually, I have to do less editing because if you think you're like uh, have 30 second kick double bass drum and you, you edit every note, you have like 32 edits per bar. So everything is chopped up, like all the symbols are chopped up like crazy if you do that. But if you like uh, take the kick out of the equation, of the editing equation, then you mainly uh, maybe only have like two snare hits per bar. You only have like two or four edits, maybe on the one with the, the crash symbol and then um, two snare edits, so everything else stays much more natural. Do you, I, when you're editing, are you going super, super tight to the grid or are you just tugging it towards there? What's the sort of philosophy on the edit? Actually, my philosophy is like make everything super tight. I, I think for me, it works really well. Um, to have a really tight foundation. It's also easier for the guitar players and the bass player to um, play on a really tight drum set. And uh, so they don't have to learn like the shift or like the movement in time. And to get some extra dirt back, it's a lot of times for me, at least um, easier to let the bass player and, and to a certain extent, also the guitar players like just play over the, the really tight drums, but don't edit the guitars and bass so much. So you got the really tight timing feel from the drums and like some extra dirt and, and humanity. You get it uh, from the guitars and from the bass, which might not be that tight. So let's check out some of the course here. Okay, let's move on to the vocals. A couple of vocal tracks going on. Let's start with um, Andy's vocals because that's what I recorded. Vocal mic was an SM7 into the Chandler Germanium pre and the Distressor right during the recording. So I got a healthy amount of compression right away and a pretty cool sound. This is the EQ setting, basically a little smiley curve and a low cut, right? Just cutting 732 hertz by 1 dB and giving it some low end, 2.5 dB at 150 and some high end, 3 dB. Experiments in thrash! Years of progression! The torch was passed! Sequel with new cast! Yeah, mainly giving it some bite. There's also a 1 dB boost at about 5k. Especially these two boosts will make it more present. Then we have some compression, some extra compression going on. UAD 1176 Rev A, which I think 
adds some high end as well, a little bit. Experiment in fresh years of progression. That torch was passed. Release a set to max, like all the way to the right. It's the fastest release, right? And attack, um, not mega fast, four to one setting, and I'm getting about like. 10 dB reduction max. And there's a second compressor, which in this case is the Pro C2, the vocal setting. Experiment in fresh years of progression. Getting about like another 3 dB of compression. I like the dual compression, always works for me on the vocals. Some DSing in the ending, because through the compression, sometimes it can bring up. DS sounds, so I like to use the DSer after the compression, or like in this case, last in the chain. Experiment in thrash! Years of progression! That torch was passed! Sequel with new cast! About like 40B of DSing going on. And sound effects, reverb, delay. Really like the UAD lexicon 224. Four aggressive vocals and if I don't want the reverb to be too obvious. I mean if I had a ballad with a like a singer and a beautiful voice and I want a big reverb, um I have other choices. But for like this kind of metal music heavy stuff, I want some depth, I want some width, but I don't want the reverb to be too obvious. And I think the lexicon, it's basically the default preset, right? Does a really good job with it. I think I got some extra EQing after that. Once again, rolling off some high end and low end. And the reverb fader is minus seven, which is relatively loud. Gonna take a listen. Let's start dry and that, then add in the reverb. Experiment in thrash! Years of progression! That torch was passed! Sequel with new cast! It's, it's quite a bit healthy amount of reverb, but I think in the context, like the guitars basically soak it up like a sponge. So to really hear the reverb as such, you'd need even a lot more. Let's take a listen without a delay still, but with the reverb on. Feels pretty dry, right? Let's add in the delay. Experiment in thrash! Years of progression! That torch was passed! Sequel with new cast! Got the timeless three delay going on. Little bit of drive, little bit of lo-fi, little bit of diffuse, which like changes the the echo basically to more like a little bit like a reverb sound. And there's some filtering going on in the delay already. Pyramids and thrash! Years of progression! That torch was passed! And the timing setting is set to quarter notes. The delay also goes into the reverb. Experiments and thrash! Years of progression! That torch was passed! Sequel with new cast! Yeah, that's with a delay and reverb. Experiment in thrash! Years of progression! That torch was passed! Sequel with new cast! Like the heat of the lash! Yes, and I think... The settings for the other vocal tracks are basically the same. Difference being in the chorus, we have Andy singing and Tom at the same time. So I did a little bit of panning by 15. So Andy is plus 15, Tom is minus 15. So they are not completely on top of each other because they're singing at the same time, right? Settings for Tom are very similar. Same effects. Like the little bullish. Yeah, compression and DSing is the same. And the fracking flash! Also sound effects, same reverb and delay. Then we have like this double tracks, which is basically like the crew. We had 
left and right tracks from Tom, left and right tracks from Andy, and some crew vocals, which Tom sent to me, so I'm not exactly sure who's the crew. And the crew is not very tight, but since the other tracks are pretty tight. Total thrash! Total thrash! Total thrash! Total thrash! Total thrash! Total thrash! I think in the context it works pretty cool um, because it gives it this extra untightness to make it more sound like a crew because it's every, if everybody in the crew is mega tight, it doesn't sound like a crew, right? So you need some guys who are like a bit early or a bit late. Let's take a look at the crew real quick. Nothing on the singer track, but in the group we have some EQ, which is basically a high-end lift and taking away some mid-range low cut and some compression. Just use the C2 and set the stereo link to basically unlinked um, because I wanted it to act like basically two compressors with the same settings, but the side sidechains are not linked. So if there's only signal on the left, it will only react on the left side and vice versa. About five dBs of reduction going on. Same vocal reverb. And there is a special delay for the crew, which is half now, again, time to three. So it's longer. There's some space after the shots, right? And also I think it sounds bigger to have like this long, really echo. It's not just like a little delayed signal, it's really like an echo. I can really hear it echoing. Then we have like the Andy left right vocals. There's some Saturn, like some distortion basically, saturation. If uh, the band split on to only affect the higher frequencies, right? Crossover at 300 hertz, warm tape setting gives it a little extra drive. Total thrash! Nothing crazy, but a little bit. Different EQing, now high end boost. Total thrash! Total thrash! Total thrash! Because the sender vocals, like the, the main vocals basically, um, or the, the, the crew member that's standing in the sender, this is like the regular EQ treatment, like in the verses, right? And the left right channels have the bit flatter treatment to make it sound different. Yeah, you can see there's a little bit of automation going on. And what you see here are mainly uh, delay throws. We have like certain words that are thrown, hence the name, into the delay. So there's like an extra delay, only set up as an effect delay basically um, for certain words. And actually, because I wanted different styles, so different length, I set up different ones. So you can see there's throw one and throw LR. And the its story has been told! Check out, let's check out this spot. Its story has been told! I travel back in time! Been told! I travel back. Yeah, there was a little space. Um, I wanted this like ping pong left right effect. Effects on the delay are some drive, lo fi, and diffuse, and no feedback because after the two repeats, like left right, the verse continues. Yes, been told! I travel back in time! So I especially set up this delay to act exactly like that, especially for this spot, basically. Okay, and for the ending, which sounds like this. Yeah, the big old thrash in the ending. Um, I just uh, thought 
without an extra effect. It's, it just was fresh and then it was over and sounded a bit boring. So there is some extra reverb just for this final shout. Yes! Seventh Heaven, Liquid Sonics, large hall preset. So like the singers end, but there's still this whole reverb going on to make it sound a bit bigger in the ending. Yes! Thanks, Kai. I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time to uh, give us a little bit of background. Um, obviously, we love what you and Christian are doing over there. Absolutely superb, making amazing sounding records. So thanks for sharing the uh, the experience with us. And everybody, there will be a link down there. Kai's course is only $19. Yes, only $19. You can also join, frankly, you should join the Cola Audio Cult. It's an incredible community, and there's tons and tons of these courses. And Kai, of course, is in there himself. Kai, you rock. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. Check out the course. I give away all my secrets, so it's definitely worth it. All right, I've got one, one quick question. If you only had one guitar amp for thrash, what would the guitar amp be? What's your favorite thrash guitar amp? My personal amp for like metal is a Mesa rectifier, dual rectifier, but it's not what we used for Trader. We used Engel exclusively. Oh, I have I have both Engel and I have a dual rectifier. I'm looking over there. So, ah, I didn't know that. So dual rectifier for the kind of scoopiness? Everything, aggressiveness, scooped sound, low yeah. end, like works most of the time for me for everything metal and, and harder music. And what about the cab? What cab would you use? Mesa oversized with the vintage, vintage 30 speakers. Ah, uh, nice. All right, well, thanks for that tip. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kai. Thanks, everybody. So long, farewell, la vie saying, au revoir, adios, ciao, tschüss, tschüss, goodbye.